The old astrologers, back in the times of Ptolemy and the beginnings of Chaldean astrological research, divided the seven ages of man between the then known planets and to cover everything above the age of 70. They said Saturn rules from then to the end of life. This is subject to some modifications, however. And it seems to me that the answer is that we will have to recalculate the period after 70. I think we should begin by saying from 71 to 80, the individual is under the rulership of Uranus. From 81 to 90, Neptune. And from 90 to 91 to 100, Pluto. In other words, we need to include these others in our calculating for the simple reason the human life expectancy at the present time brings these influences to bear upon ever more human beings who may survive into the 80s, 90s, and even reach 100. So to cover all of this, it becomes necessary to assign various significant activities to those older years rather than to simply sum them up and say from Saturn on is the end. It isn't the end anymore. And we have to begin to evaluate uh, the life of the person who has passed through the old Chaldean cycle. Actually, the problem of what to do with life after retirement from active occupations is now becoming a very are now becoming very important because more and more persons have anywhere from 10 to 20 or 25 year life expectancy after retirement from business or the responsibilities that have held their attention during their important economic years. Now when we come to study this, we try to think out what man is really concerned with in life. And we find that to the average person, life is simply a process of continuing to supply oneself and one's families with the necessities of material existence. In other words, it's a workday world, either physical labor or mental labor through the productive years of our economic existence. Yet actually, we must realize that the process of making a living in this physical environment is possibly the least important aspect of our existence. From a physical standpoint, yes, it is necessary. But beyond that point, we have to remember that anything that we accumulate in this world must stay behind when we leave. And if we have nothing to take with us, the question is how important a life have we actually experienced? Have we done anything that can go forward except perhaps a moral quality of having been as honest as conditions permitted? This means that there is some other reason for life than merely paying for the food we eat and the housing that shelters it. We have to have something that develops within ourselves. The advancement of the person is also an important part of living. And this is generally summed up in the term experience. The things we experience in life become very important to us as we grow older. But if, if by any chance we have had a melancholy nature, we can wipe out the value of experience. If it has been against our general happiness or our desires, we can forget it or consider it a loss. Actually, however, experience is the thing that is most important in the life that we live. We are here to learn through experience. This is exactly the opposite of what has, become, what has become considered to be an adage of importance. 
a slogan by which to live. And it so goes something like this. If I want it, I will have it. If I don't want it, I won't accept it. Now, on this arbitrary basis, pleasure, comfort, personal satisfaction at the moment, evasion of responsibility, and a certain plaudit or overtone of success, these become the important factors in life. The result is that we have very, very little to work with. Now, quite often we come across people in, in various conditions of what we might term um, a maturity of living. The individual who reaches retirement age may take as a slogan, I'm through with work. Now I'm going to enjoy myself. Don't ask me to do anything I do not want to do. That sounds pretty good if you can, if you can get away with it. But has the individual an answer to that part of his own statement, namely that he is going to try and be happy? He is going to try to do the things he has always wanted to do. He is going to use his advancing years to really do what has been on his heart and mind since the beginning, and which probably has been blocked by economic necessities with at least 15, maybe 25, or even 30 years of reasonable activity possible to him, what is he going to do with this time? Most people seemingly do not make much use of it, because when they reach retirement, they have a sudden break in their life pattern. All of a sudden, the busy individual has nothing to do. He may be on a comfortable pension or social security, but he has nothing to do that he has long done and about which he has habits and skills. He suddenly finds himself with a future that is completely uncharted. And we see what people do with this future and sometimes it's a little pathetic. One group will settle down to play canasta for the rest of their lives and they will be able to fill up almost every moment of their waking hours with trivia that means nothing, which they are not even going to think about. Another individual group or group will decide to travel. But they may be unprepared for travel and may find it a little too much of an exertion after a while. They are trying to fulfill a certain type of frustration. They've always wanted to do different things and visit different places. Another group simply sits quietly in front of the television and lets the television make the noise. And it does. And they watch every program carefully and feel that they are having what they've always looked forward to, the pleasure of doing nothing. Others move in on family. They find an effort to control their descendants. They want to influence the lives of their children and grandchildren, perhaps more than is best. After all, such interference is largely finding something to do that seems to be important. Then there are a few who try to improve their mental lives. They have decided, as an old friend of mine once decided, that uh, they, may, they might be many people speaking Spaniards, Spanish in the years ahead, so he might as well learn now and know it when he comes back in his next embodiment. <laughs> uh, this is a, a long struggle for what he thinks he wants to do. Then there are those who join various maturity occupations. They take bus drives to Death Valley. They have picnics. They do all kinds of things. Perhaps they have a competitive tatting exhibition or make bed quilts. No one knows what they're going to do, but they're filling up time because to them there is no particular future and they are no longer responsible to society which is now becoming responsible for them. 
So things drift until nature in its due course produces a coronary or a hardening of the arteries. This is a very serious waste of energy and time. It is definitely an inexcusable lack of planning. The individual who has every reason to expect he has a future should do something about it. And even if he shouldn't live to do all the things he's planned, the decision to do instead of to wait, the determination to grow instead of to gradually go to seed, these changes of attitudes are very important, not only uh, for the pleasure of the person, but for the actual extent of his life years. It has been proven on countless occasions that the individual who has a particular plan is more likely to last long enough to fulfill it than a person who has no plan and therefore has no real reason for existence. The time to consider all these matters, of course, is as early as your mind can get fixed on them. Some people are now beginning to realize that it is important to plan a future. And those metaphysically inclined, or who believe in reincarnation, or who have a desire to recognize a, compensing, a compensatory principle in nature, will do better than those without this. The individual who does not know what is going to happen to him afterwards, if anything, is not nearly as likely to make a good and constructive choice as the individual who believes firmly that he is eternal and is here to grow. Now, if he has this kind of a philosophy, it is also good for him to study his own nature, as psychologists have discovered. Nearly everyone has a dominant and a subdominant interest in life. When you go to the university, you generally select a dominant and also a subdominant in education. You may decide you want to be a banker, but you want something else besides, so you take a course in language or in art or in literature to balance the one intensity that you have selected. Now, in living, the same problem is very necessary. We must have a subdominant from the beginning in order to tr achieve a good life. Now, the uh, Wall Street Journal probably wouldn't advise this. They feel that when you're in business or working, you must give everything you have and are to it. You must think of nothing else. You must spend all your time knowing more and more about the one job you have. And if you can forget everything else, often including your own family, you may get to be president of the corporation in due time. If not, you will uh, retire with a chime clock, large, handsome one, with a label on it bearing your name. You are supposed to be one-pointed in order to succeed. But this is the kind of success that you cannot take with you. It is little, little difficult to believe, even by any religious doctrine, that an individual who has given everything he has to banking is prepared for a universal existence in which banking is of no consequence whatsoever. <laughs> the uh, answer is, of course, the Egyptian idea of the person who was earthbound. When the broker was earthbound and died, they gave him a table and a chair in front gate of paradise. And he was there to change money, make accounts, set up banking uh, for all the spirits that came by. Of course, they had nothing to give him to deposit. He had nothing to accept and no place to put it. But everybody lived in a kind of a dream life, fulfilling their common expectancies. The Egyptians proved conclusively, however, that this particular way of life was ineffective. So having uh, realized the importance of divided interest, it is very important that if a person is in an artistic field, that he develops some type of intellectual interest. If he is in an intellectual field, he should work for aesthetics or some branch of learning that will balance his major activity. Now he may say that he has no time for this. Well, nature took that into consideration also. 
And very often, when the person marries, the spouse will have an alternate interest. The interest of the family can become important to the individual. He can find that perhaps he is devoted uh, to a shop or a store, but the wife is interested in music or language or in art, and the sharing of this secondary interest can become important. And as the individuals grow older and their materialistic interests lessen, they have found something in common besides merely the everyday existence which people live by. So one way, one way or another, it is advisable to try to locate a field of compensatory activity to balance the things that we commonly do. This is one of the problems that is being revealed clearly in the program of Women's Lib. <laughs> the woman who has been a housekeeper, a mother, a parent, finds it important to have other activities. The children grow up. The world which occupied her completely, maybe, for 20 years, suddenly is not sufficient. And long before retirement, uh, by age, she is looking for a new outlet, something that will give her a reason for existence when the more intimate things have gradually faded away. So she is out and finds herself a housewife who is suddenly a senator, a judge, or an executive in business. This is the compensation again from an emotional to a mental level. Generally speaking with men, the best compensations are from a mental to an emotional or aesthetic level, or from some form of self-improvement which can produce results almost immediately. Many of the most important people in the world would never have had a reputation at all had they died at 65. Their careers began after that. They did many interesting things which earlier life fitted them to do, but did not necessarily demand the doing. The most important first decision, probably, is to stop looking at retirement as a time of doing nothing and the happiness of indolence. There is no happiness in indolence. It is simply a gratification of a poor attitude and becomes a bad habit. Looking, therefore, to find out what we might do, I would say that the person should have the modifying or secondary interest uh, awake in himself by the time he's 30 or 35 years old. He should begin to discover what he needs to be a complete person. In the past, we have had various outlets for this particular problem of ourselves. The greatest modifying influence in the life of the majority of human beings has been religion. This was something that could not be completely dominated by materialistic concerns. It was the emotional outlet for many, many millions of people. Today, however, this is not as dominant an outlet as it was in the old times. Today, religion is a very important compensating uh, attitude or research project. And as the person reaches retirement, he may give greater and greater study to this subject. But if it looks like this is going to help him, then early in life he should begin to qualify his religious instincts and make them important in his life and useful and constructive and escape the dangers that fall to many people in religion in older years, and that is bigotry or fanaticism. The answer to that, of course, is that the uh, religion of older years must be well settled in the consciousness by a study of comparative religion, by an understanding of religion's place in conduct, and by the gradual modifying of personal conduct to keep within the pattern of religious ethics. All these things can be considered. Another fi a final point in connection with this is the importance of the arts as a contrast to the sciences. The scientist is probably one of the worst offenders 
in the problem of limited interests. He is a biologist and everything in his life is biology. He is astronomy and he measures people and world conditions and everything by the galaxy. He is concerned in uh, mathematics and mathematics becomes an obsession. And in higher intellectualism, it is easy for the attitudes of the peer group, the great scientist group, to cause the person to become hopelessly involved in bad mental habits. He will do everything possible uh, to stay within the boundaries of his scientific viewpoint. He will reject things that conflict with science, although they may be true. He will overlook a great part of the warmth and beauty of life while he is studying advanced mathematics or the uh, history of the monad. He is always inclined to make his mental occupation his uh, vacation preoccupation. He does not face the importance of variety, of contrast and things of that nature. A few have done, however, a rather good job in maintaining interest. One of the most common interests of science is music. It is in this area that they seem to find the greatest possibility uh, of a compensatory outlet. The music is probably selected largely because it is not argumentative. It is not something that you are going to be able to break down, tear apart, and do something with from a scientific viewpoint. Music is an expression. It is true that it has to be skilled. The individual has to practice and learn. But it becomes a tremendously important expression on a world level that is not tied up with mathematics and physics. A great example, of course, of this was Einstein who was more or less a competent violinist. Uh, he says less, others thought more. But the great concert that uh, Einstein ever gave was in a, so a small hotel where there were only a half a dozen people present, and you will never guess who his accompanist on the piano was. Durante. <laughs> and he said he wasn't so good, too. But they had a big time together. Jimmy Durante accompanying Einstein on the piano. They both had a good time. It was important. And these outlets are not only things to give fun and pleasure, but they require hard work to accomplish a creditable level of performance. Music is excellent. If music is not so good, we can go to the banker who has spent his whole life uh, accumulating funds, handling them, and uh, we hope not ex expanding with them. But anyway, what does, ba what does the retired banker do? Well, one of the most common things that Andrew Carnegie did was build libraries. He found his outlet in that area. Another one collected art, music. Mellon, the great authority uh, on uh, aluminum, uh, collected classic bindings and things of this nature in rare books and manuscripts. Every one of these mental specialists instinctively had the realization that he wasn't sufficient and did not have a full life. Now, many women have taken the attitude that their children is their hobby. I've had that told to me a number of times when I brought the subject up with distraught mothers of one type or another. A child is not a hobby. A child is a career. And those who do it well have done a great deal, but the child will grow up. And when you try to control it too long, you get into trouble. There comes the life point in every mother where she has to shift her emotions away from her children and towards something else. Now, on these conditions, the secondary interest becomes very, very important. She may turn to business or to science after the children have uh, left the nest. But in order to, success in, uh, to succeed in any of these things, the mother must have started a little earlier 
to decide what she was going to do. It's quite a shock to suddenly be forced to take up a subject you've never thought of before. It is far better from the very beginning to estimate what you're going to do when the job you're doing is finished. If you can do this, you will have more people who are no longer thinking of themselves as through, simply because one interest or one responsibility has been taken away. In, the philosophy, in philosophy, in these fields of which we are especially interested, the thought dominates that there is a tremendous world of information and interest in the various ideals of humankind. One of the points then to work on is to build our own internal stability. While we're busy morning, noon, and night, and maybe headed for ulcers and a breakdown, it is difficult to establish personal stability. It is difficult to get past the point of worrying to death over things that essentially will never be improved by worry. It is necessary, consequently, for the individual to make in his business adjustments a good or orderly approach to life, and when the business life is finished, continue to live in an orderly manner. This means that the life principle must be big enough to include both work and rest. The individual must learn to rest constructively just as he worked constructively. He must never think retirement is the end of anything. It is a shift of emphasis from a subdominant to another level to release the inner potential of the person and help that person to be so busy that they forget to grow old. This is a very valuable point. We have all kinds of sad tales of persons who have finished a business career. They visit their children and finally decide the children really don't need them, and in some cases are frankly say they don't. They try to find some interest in some form of education, but they're not very well fitted for it. Then they begin to look perhaps closer to the fact, and that is to find ways of helping other people. The greatest uh, side career that anyone can have is helpfulness. A sympathy, an understanding, an ability to rise above criticism, to rise above all the false values that lead to misunderstanding, and be able to help people. When you do not know what else to do, forget yourself and help a person whose need is greater than yours. Actually, therefore, we find a lot of people doing this simply because it is very important to them. But very many of them reach the age of wanting to be helpful with very little skill or experience in the matter. It is difficult for them to help except within the area of their own personal experience. They can help people whose problems have been the same as their own. Other people, it's more difficult to help. So, at the beginning of this pre-retirement philosophy, we start figuring out how to help people long before we take on that career. Or we may dabble in it a little, but a disappointment or two should never frustrate us. But we should begin to think in terms of learning all that we can that will help us to help others. If we have experiences in life in which things we have done have helped others, this is the beginning of a very important career. The average person who reaches 65 in reasonably good health has already taken the most important course in psychology that has ever been given his own life. If he hasn't learned from that, he's in bad trouble. But he has learned, but it has never occurred to him that he was going to do with anything except store it away in himself. And he very often goes his entire length of life without sharing the values of a few important experiences through which he has passed. Sometimes he says nobody cares, but that is not true. There's always someone who cares. And with the world in its present condition, the need for genuine, unselfish, informed helpfulness is very great. 
But to be an informed helper, you have to have information. You have to have started earlier. You have to pass through certain disillusionments and not be like one person I know who, having thought of nothing but themselves until retirement, suddenly decided they want to be, wanted to be a philanthropist. They really wanted to go out and help people. So the person they first helped cheated them out of everything they had. This was really a bad experience, but a very informative one. This person, in order to be helpful, had to have the skill to protect himself and the wisdom to direct and assist others. The only way to do it is to start with your own background. Find out what has happened to you, how it could have been better, how you could have avoided problems, and instead of blaming people who have hurt you, start trying to learn what you should have done about it long before it happened. All this type of thing gets us past that point that is mentioned by King Leah, who says it is sharper than a serpent's tooth to have a thankless child. And that's true. But we should learn these things in time to know what to do about it, or to plan a career in which that child could not help but be thankful because of the skill and wisdom with which we administered their lives while they were in our responsibility. So there's always this problem of getting ready for this new program that is to come. I think that the average person with uh, some limitations will not find it practical to try to forget life by traveling all the time. Good trips, fine. Occasional journeys to a place you've always wanted to go to can be tremendously important. But to use it simply uh, to, to get away from yourself, remember always that no matter where you go, you're always with yourself. There's the one person you can't get away from. Actually, also, uh, travel must have meaning. I remember, as I think I've told before, about the uh, tour in which the ship with its wonderful cargo of people was, ha was anchored off the city of Athens. And on the, in the lounge, the bridge tournaments were going full rate at that time. So one of the people who said, uh, uh, said to the uh, God, to a, to a guide, said, uh, is it worthwhile for us to go to shore to look at these old ruins? After all, we are in the third game of a very important uh, bridge tournament. And I think we're going to win. And the guide said with great seriousness, I would advise you to stay right with the bridge. Don't interfere with it. A person who was more interested in bridge than seeing the great uh, glory of the Greek culture should stay there. But probably, if the truth were known, he should have stayed at home. <laughs> it would have saved money and been the same, and he could have had his bridge tournaments as he always had them. So unless there is a reason, unless a trip fulfills a secret hope, a purpose, a determination, unless it ties with attitudes towards life, the journey will sanction or support. There's very little outlet. Again, travel is a sophisticated career. And to make anything out of it, you must want to go where you go. And you must learn something. And you must go because you want to learn something. Just to waste time at the ship's bar is no particular value to anyone concerned. So the matter of making something out of the older years is based largely on what has been built up in younger years. Now this is a fascinating world. Everything in it is of interest to somebody. And many persons find a tremendous relaxation in the, in the examination of nature's processes. I think one of the best programs that we have on television these days is are the programs that are made up of nature studies. Studies of places and peoples and things and not fiction. Because the fact is far more interesting, remarkable, and informative. And helps to give us a new dimension of sight. As we step out of the old dimension of job, we must step into a new dimension of insight. 
we must be looking forward to those day, years and days as the opportunities for the best things we've ever done and the fulfillment of the deepest and most noble of our impulses and instincts. If this is the case, then we will begin looking forward to a systematically organized retirement. A retirement in which there will be no break in our activity and no burden upon other people. One of the problems with the retirement of men is that the first time in their lives they're home all the while. And the, uh, le the wife finds suddenly that a life that has been largely in her own keeping, as particularly in the daylight period, where she has been doing as she pleased, shopping, visiting, suddenly finds herself at home tied to a sulky elderly man who has nothing on his mind except business. This type of situation isn't fair to either person, and whichever one is in this sulking mood, or is sitting around waiting for his arteries to harden, uh, is no companion. A great loss of intimacy and personal relationships threatens, and it's astonishing how many elderly people divorce or separate, simply because they were happy together when they were busy, but they were unable to rest together. This is a very important point to consider all the way along. So those things which we're going to do later, either together or separately, should be well developed before the time comes. Then the first five years after retirement will not be a difficult adjustment period. It will be a period of greater activity in the effort to catch up the time we have wasted trying to make a living. And we may have made the living, but the time is wasted as far as the complete person is concerned. There is nothing but, again, the old problem of the economic dependency with which we have burdened our world for the last several thousands of years. Another very interesting point to consider is that leisure is also the possibility for the advancement of personal skills. The person who has never been skillful in anything will find many opportunities to make use of the complicated mental organism with which he has been endowed. He will find the possibility of creating things, of fashioning with his own hands things that he used to buy, he will then understand why and how uh, a great artist or a great musician attains the uh, virtuosity which we admire. He begins to realize that he can start to play the piano, but there's not much danger of his becoming a Paderewski. But he can play it, and he plays it a little, and he feels in himself that he is a great artist, and his friends have sense enough to let him continue to think so. But a little tune that he has learned himself becomes more important to him than a hundred-person orchestra playing Bach because he's doing it himself. And the process of phoning it off or selling it out or something all the time which makes up the life of the evasive person trying to run a business is much less satisfying than the sudden ability to play a simple a bit of music with one finger on each hand. It's different because you do it. And in, re and in business hours, the things you want to do, you think about. In retirement, the things you want to do, you do. And this sudden development of actual participation in your own thoughts, dreams, hopes, and ideas becomes tremendously valuable and important. From the standpoint of the more mystical approach, the more wisely we live our life here, the closer we come to the universal plan. Because the universal plan had its purpose in putting us here. We were not here to wait to die. We were not here to cheat each other or to talk ourselves or evade ourselves out of facts. We were not even here to permit some religious belief to support false attitudes of our own. We were not here to be a fanatic 
We were not here to be intolerant. We were not here to do any kind of judging of other people that is detrimental, especially if we do not even know them. We are here to improve the quality of our own integrity. We can be honest without too much insight. We just kind of keep the common rules of life. But to graduate this honesty up to integrity means a conscious dedication to values that are worthwhile. Now, why should we do this? Some people think there is no life after death. Then why should we be great and noble and try to fill our closing years with uh, hard work in the name of growth? Well, if it's true, which I doubt severely, that we do not have any further life, then what we do between 60 and 75 or 80 or 85, while we're still here, makes being here for those years better. Whether there's anything after isn't important at that point. It's to do it now and to get the virtues and values and have them available if they are needed at some future time. Others feel that uh, it is our moral right to rebel against the pressures of society and to become anti-establishmentarians as we get older. Don't do anything useful because other people do it, and it interferes with freedom. Instead of being useful, become an alcoholic. This is one way of getting out of a situation of doing nothing and trying to make it work. Every bit of effort we make is useful when we make it. It is good at the time we make the effort, and the consequences continue to help all through the years ahead. So, assuming that we do have a life afterwards, Socrates brings this up very beautifully in uh, the few moments before his own death, uh, where he says that he is either going to go into another life where he will find the answers to all the questions that he has never been able to answer in this world, or else he will go to sleep and will know, have no future whatsoever and will never know that he even existed. Those are his ends. But those who persecuted him and unjustly sentenced him to death, he says they are the ones who will suffer because they will not pass to nothingness they will have to live with their own conscience for the rest of their lives. So Socrates sort of summed it up. And to the very end of life, he's learned, studied, thought, and served according to his principles. It's actually, Socrates was not sentenced to death. People don't mostly know this, but it's true. He was not. He was sentenced to pay a small fine because he was found guilty of a minor offense. Plato offered to pay the fine immediately, and Socrates said no. He said, I am not paying these, the fine, because I am not guilty, and I am not going to buy freedom by perjuring myself. So he died rather than pay a small fine and admit a fault that he did not believe that he possessed. So uh, the problem of what happens uh, if we do have life after death, which most people now are beginning to think is pretty likely, and uh, we begin to think about it, we know that the better we are equipped to go on, the better the world is going to be and the better we are going to be. The more a nation gains in a philosophy of life through constructive experience, the longer that nation will exist. And when it does fail, it will become a memory that is eternal for good in the society and world to which it has belonged. Therefore, in our own cases, every example of the integrities we believe become part of a peer group that knows that these things are important, and they become inspiration to others who might otherwise have no thoughts of the matter. Actually, also, assuming that we do have a returning life, then we must come back to something. If we live a life beyond this one, there's only one reason why we should live it. 
That is, there's still more to learn. We haven't learned it all, or we wouldn't come back. And because we haven't learned it all, we do come back. And we do come back to face problems we have never solved. So every life includes within itself a number of unsolved problems, and these are the things that are most annoying most people. So the more problems you solve this time, the fewer you'll have to face some other time. If you've gotten over a bad disposition in this life, you don't have to live with it in the next one. If you have served generously and kindly and lovingly in this life, you may expect such services will be your reward. When they happen, you won't remember that you deserved them, but they will happen because you as a human being have earned them, whether you are conscious of it or not. If, on the other hand, you go on being selfish and self-centered and indifferent to values, you return to a world which you will brand as selfish and inconsiderate because it is simply returning to you that which you put in yourself. It is very important, then, from any standpoint, now, later, or before now, that each person develop as many, many of the virtues of living as possible. That every time a situation arises that calls for a decision, that we should make one as wisely as we can. We can no longer live by a philosophy, I don't want to and I'm not going to. This is the philosophy that governs many people, and it has absolutely no basic value. Instead of that, we are going to try in every decision to make one as constructive as possible. We are not going to try to avoid. We are not going to try to cheat a few dollars out of the orphan and the widow. We are going to do the things that are going to make life richer here and now. We are not going to want to look back even in our own years to nothing but mistakes or short-term activities. We want to look upon life as a, as a single great career made up of all the incidents of daily existence. We're going to want to look back upon our life as we would upon a distinguished or at least honorable bibliography. We are going to want to be able to feel that all the way along the line we have learned something, that we've done something worthwhile, and that we have served in some way to make a better world. Most people are not much interested in a better world. Some of them will say now, and I've heard it recently, why make a better world? There won't be any. Nuclear problems will take care of that. Actually, we don't know this. We are not at all sure that the nuclear holocaust will ever actually come. We can hope that in spite of our various delinquencies, we're not quite that foolish. But even if we should pass through this, let us realize that the part of us that is eternal is not going to cease. We are not going to lose existence because of any disaster in this world. The only thing that can destroy our futures is the disasters we make inside ourselves. And these are the things that we have to constantly think about. I think I've told you before that world end scares are not particularly rare. There was a bad one in New England during the lifetime of Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, the prophets, religiously oriented, announced that doom was at hand, that all was lost, that the uh, great rule of the Antichrist had come, and they were all going to be wiped out. So these trusting people, believing this, made a curious decision. They sold all their properties and worldly goods and when the day came, sat on the curb, curb with the money in both hands. <laughs> the world ended, they'd at least have the money to the last it's conceivable moment. Of course, nothing happened. And they probably had the uh, bad karma of having to buy back their own homes at a slightly higher rate. <laughs> Someone went up to Emerson on that morning and said, Dr. Emerson, if the world should end, what are you going to do? Emerson was a very quiet man. He thought for a while. He said, well, 
If it ends, I guess, guess I'll have to get along without it. <laughs> and that is the way it is with most of these problems. And I think we should realize that almost certainly we're going to have to get along with what happens. But if we are right inside, we can handle it when we come, when it comes. And if we are right enough inside, it won't come at all. It all depends on what we do. And this, in turn, depends upon a long, close, friendly acquaintance with ourselves. We've got to really know a little bit about what we are and why we're here and what we look like to somebody else when we walk by them. We have to understand life in an entirely different way. We have had many races upon this planet which have disappeared. And the, the records and annals and recordings of all of these civilizations are somewhere locked inside of ourselves. The continents of the past are gone. The Medes and the Persians of antiquity have ceased to exist. But all of these, every stranger, every ancient time, every hero, every slave of the past lives in us. We are the past. We are standing at this moment on the quest of ourselves. What we have been, how we got there, how we felt about everything along the way. If we were uh, chronic campaigners for 50 or 100 incarnations, we will still be. If everything looks terrible now, it's because we always looked at it that way some time ago. It is far more important and significant and valuable to realize that each day the individual has the right to surmount the negativeness which he has brought with him from hundreds of lives. He has an opportunity to be bigger before he leaves here than he was before he got here. He has the right to make the changes in himself, which he can mentally assume these changes would have changed history had they been made before. He can't grow until he knows he can grow, except by experience and pain. But when he grows properly by the effort of his own consciousness, most of the pain is gone, and the growth is real and enduring. But if we continue to live all through business and retirement with little purposes, little attitudes, little fusses, little misunderstandings, we will have them into the next embodiment. Now, of course, in this situation, we find a certain uh, disagreement among some people. The p people say, why should we be victimized by others. Why should we have to have good dispositions when other people do what they please? Well, the other people do what they please and they get what they deserve. If we have good dispositions, we do as we please and we get what we deserve. It all depends on what we invest, what we take out. And the great investment of our generation and all generations is a solid investment in personal integrity. Now, how do we do this? Most people are not heroic, and when they're tired out of 40 or 50 years of grind and are disillusioned by the pol political situations that arise, by the social conditions, and have certain grievances for the times they've been exploited and deceived and injured, and tragedies that have set in, broken homes, wayward children, all these things they look back on and they say to themselves, well, maybe I have to be excused for not being very successful because it just seems as though nothing was ever in, the li in life that did me much good. Well, this of course is a, a perfectly legitimate possibility of attitude. But when we hold it, we should sit down very carefully and, you say, to, and say to ourselves, yes, I had a broken home. It was a great tragedy in my life. Now then, start back five to ten years before the home broke and see if you can't find some reason why you at least were partly re responsible for it breaking. Can you think back over a situation of that kind and say, 
if I had taken a different attitude at that moment, if I had forgiven something or overlooked something or forgotten something and risen above some petty disturbance, would I still have had a broken home? Or would I be comparatively happy and the home would be secure if I had done something a little different? We all think of what other people have done to us but we are a little forgetful of what we have done to them. And in our karmic life, the problems of thinking this through must come by a more or less thoughtful approach to living. A lot of people are not going to have this approach for a long time. But everyone who is interested in growth, interested in spiritual matters, interested in self-improvement, should give a lot of thought to these factors because they play a very large part in our uh, careers and in the futures we look forward to. I have noticed definitely that people who have forgotten themselves or who have dedicated their time, even in younger years, to public service or public help, have had a better life and a more secure environment than those with other types of attitudes. It isn't necessary for the person to make some huge sacrifice, but it is necessary to have a good constructive attitude. If as a result of 50 years in business, you have come to the conclusion that it is all a crime and should be abolished, that business is a terrible thing, then this is going to work against you as you retire. You're going to retire into a world you don't like and you don't believe in. If, however, you say to yourself, yes, it was a tough, a tough job. I had a lot of trouble. I had many things happen that I wish hadn't happened. But out of it all came certain things that were good. And out of all this adversity, I've suddenly discovered the reason for it. And the reason for it is ignorance. The reason for it may also be overambition. It also can be spite or jealousy. And all these emotions, with their current consequences, have to be faced. And it's a wonderful thing to get them out of the way before you go forward into a retirement. Because in a sense, a retirement is a new birth in time. The individual is born again. Any time that he changes his position in life, changes his viewpoints, changes his attitudes and his interests. So the individual who retires is born into the world of retirement. He is no longer part of a world of these complex situations that he fought for so many years. Of course, he may still have some of them hanging on if he uh, was unable to clear the slate. But in any event, it is a new birth. And a new birth is a new opportunity. It's a new opportunity to think back upon your own mistakes and stop regretting and learn to understand. The, I know a lot of older people who sit around largely telling about the problems of their own lives. They get into a competitive uh, distressfulness. They, uh, each one outdoes the other in, the, in expressing their misfortunes lengthily and repeatedly. This does no good. But there's always someone who will top it, no matter what you say. But if instead of this, the individual can literally look back and learn what he has gained from these experiences, instead of wanting sympathy, he should be asked the simple question, what did you gain from this? Don't tell me of all the miseries you went through, but what did you learn that helped to make you a better person? Tell me that and share it with me. I probably need it too. But if we don't take this kind of attitude, retirement somehow doesn't quite work as it should. Now most people feel that retirement brings with it a gradual limitation of opportunity for self-expression. In the first five or ten years of retirement, the person may live just about the way he always lived and may feel about the same. But in 15 or 20 years of retirement, he suddenly discovers the real encroachment of age. He is not able to do the things that he wants, wanted to do. He, wasn't, he is no longer able, in other words, to keep so busy that he doesn't have to think. 
If he has enough outside activities, he can block out the contemplation of his own existence. But when he reaches a point where he has to live more and more by himself and with himself, he may have friends, he's not going to be necessarily lonely, but he's not going to be able to run away so fast because his legs aren't working that fast anymore. He has to live more and more in the small world of himself. Now, the larger he can make that world before the time comes, the better off he is. If he can make a world in which he can look back upon all the interesting things that he's done and re receives quite frequently a card or appreciation or gratitude for someone he helped, if he can remember how he learned and what he learned, and if he can have a feeling that he has put his own life in order, and he can live with himself and continue to learn through the contemplation of his own conduct. He also will probably have certain outlets. He will be able to read, he'll be able to study, he'll be able to listen and enjoy many things, but he can't quite run away from his own life as he did uh, shortly after his retirement. He has to become more and more aware that he is moving towards a major change and that this major change is not a disaster but a fulfillment. That it is the indication that he is going to have a new start but he will still remember what he knew. His next level of life will be the sum of his present level and what he has learned from it. If he hasn't learned anything from it, he'll have to have the same level again some other time. But anything he learns, he doesn't have to go through twice. No one is punished twice for the same crime. It is against the law, not only the law of man, but the law of God. He will never be deceived in the same way unless he is willing to accept deceit in the same way. He will never lose a friend again because he will not do the thing that cost him a friend in the past. Little by little he puts his life in order and gets to be very comfortable and happy about these problems. Also in those older years uh, there comes a greater need, a greater personal need for religious insight. He will have to begin to measure the quality of his religion. He will have to realize that he is a creature a divine being in a divine universe. That no matter where he goes or when he goes, he's part of a plan that is eternal. A great many human beings have created religions that are too small for this. They have created theologies that are burdensome and frets, fretful. They have also variously injured, afflicted, and persecuted each other in the name of God. The older person thinking these things through will realize how impossible such concepts are. There is no reason to assume that any time that the deity which is responsible for the creation of existence created something to hate it, something to hurt, something to destroy, something ignorant who would be damned for his ignorance. These things just don't happen. The world we live in is a good world, and this power that God's things is apparent, not a despot. And the only reason why we have experiences is because it's for our own good. That from these experiences we learn to understand ourselves, our world, and the God that fashioned it. All these things come quietly to the person who is thoughtful. No fear has to remain. Because in a universe created by an eternal principle of good, there is no real cause for fear. It is because of fear that we hurt each other. But it's because we do it, not because universal law required it. Universal law requires that each of us in his own turn shall come to the full expression and full realization of the eternal good of which he is a part. There is no reason why he should think any other way. And in the quietude of an afternoon sitting on the porch of his little house or some place where he likes to walk, the thoughtful person walks always with truth, walks always with God. And the little of the God in him 
helps him to find the God around him and in all the other things with which he comes in contact. The good person, who may have been critical in his youth, is thoughtful, unselfish, and kind as the years close in. He has been given another reason why this is easy, namely because he doesn't have to fight the fight that he has retired from. He doesn't have to hold the attitudes that he felt were necessary when he was out as a wage earner. He can now not be jealous of anyone because no one is hurting him anymore. He does not need to envy the person who has more because he realizes that he has as much as he can take with him and that is very little. He doesn't have to fight. He doesn't have to defend himself. He doesn't have to argue with people. He doesn't even have to doubt his own children or grandchildren. He's part of a life which he is gradually beginning to understand. And it is the person who understands the, the goodness of life who advances into older years with the greatest amount of peace, understanding, and contentment. And then the, uh, not only the psychiatrist in this case, but also uh, the family physician has things to say about these matters. It has been proven beyond any question of doubt that a negative thinker is more subject to sickness than a positive thinker. An individual who is sorry for himself is more likely to become rheumatic uh, or to develop various complaints and dis disturbances. Uh, according to uh, physiognomy and old Dr. Fowler, who had the f phrenology concession on the Coney Island Ferry, there is uh, something to be said about all the attitudes of people. Uh, the attitudes of individuals are very carefully classified in physiognomy and phrenology, and a certain attitude depresses the circulation of the body in a certain way. Some wrong attitudes hit the stomach head on, and from that time this gives trouble for the rest of life. And if you keep it on long enough, and worry long enough, and get nervous long enough, and nurse grievances long enough, you're apt to have ulcers. And uh, that's more or less a poetic justice. You couldn't expect anything else. How can you expect to do wrong and be right? Another type of uh, problem comes along and you, your liver gets a head-on collision with it. And little by little, every negative, negative attitude we have reacts into the physical body. For organs are instruments which not only are tied into a pattern, the, the organs of the body correspond exactly with the parts of the brain. And every organ of the body has a polarity in the brain. And when the brain gets unpleasant in that area, the body begins to suffer. The individual who uh, lives right, makes a good clean job of it, can expect much better physical condition. He will not be subject to so many ailments. He will not be so frightened of life. And he will go on going, doing the things that he thinks are interesting as long as he can. And sometimes he can do it quite a long time, if his attitudes are right. But the fretful, revengeful person who hates society, or is always complaining about what politics are doing, or what business is doing, and loves to hunt up a book that exposes somebody, this type of individual isn't going to have good health, because he hasn't got a good mind. Now, no one can stop him from doing what he's doing, but he has to be prepared for the consequences. And up to now, the world in general has never recognized these consequences as being related to their own attitudes toward life. Friendliness makes friends. Jealousy makes enemies. The individual just simply cannot live and compromise his integrities without loss to himself. So the more his life has been unreasonable, the more problem he's going to have with his health later on. Actually, it is proven again and again that uh, even diseases such as cancer, diabetes, and things of this nature are chronic ailments largely resulting from chronic attitudes. The person who for 10 or 15 years holds a bad mood 
is going to have physical consequences. And after living a very selfish, self-centered, and dogmatic life, the individual enters into a retirement with a body that is already afflicted by these attitudes. Now, it may be that if he's very wise and very careful and changes his attitudes, that he can neutralize a lot of the troubles he's caused himself. But if he continues on with the same attitudes, his aches and pains will continue. And this is something he doesn't want to really believe. He doesn't want to go on believing that his retirement is going to be fretful and he doesn't feel the fact he's been fretful all his life should have any bearing on it. But it does. So the best thing to do is get lose all such attitudes. The best thing to do is make get over every animosity and antagonism that you have ever nourished at any age, at any age. Because if you don't get over it and it becomes habit forming, if it becomes an addiction like a drug, this attitude can be the, the destruction of you in the long run. We are not presumed to have defense for our mistakes. We are rather given the judgment to get over them and to rise above any feeling that is unworthy of a human being. The fact that we have them in secret, therefore, and nobody finds it out, is no help because we can't keep our attitudes from our own bodies. We can't keep them from our own brain. We can't keep them from the pulsing beat of our hearts. These things are recorded. And there is simply no way of getting out of this kind of a situation. It has been proven definitely that a temper fit will wreck blood pressure. It would be very serious. No, it doesn't last long. You get mad. Temp blood pressure goes up 20 degrees. An hour or two later, you're sorry, the blood pressure drops again. But this is shock. Every time a dispositional shock affects us, an organ or a, f a function is damaged. It is irritated. It is hurt. It is in some way affected unpleasantly. And what a disease is to the body, an attitude is to the inner functions of life. The body is not only a mass of material, it is function. And this function can be deranged by attitude. Jealousy can affect the liver and the kidneys, seriously. And short-sightedness of attitudes can affect the eyes. All kinds of things, blood poison, all types of rheumatic ailments, are made worse by negative, appropriate attitudes which are consistent with the ailment itself. So when we go to retirement, we have to take the consequence of the intentional damage that we have done to ourselves. We won't say that it was intentional damage. We will say that it was something we did not know better about. And yet, it's a funny, interesting thing. The Bible which is a very sacred book to a great many people, is in many instances one of the best sources for information about the consequences of conduct. The Bible proves conclusively in many of its statements the importance of a simple, constructive life. It is better for your physical health to forgive your enemy than to revenge yourself upon him. It is better for your own health to give than to receive. It is better for your digestion that you permit uh, old grievances to fade away. Now, when, when we're busy all the time, the body is reasonably strong, it fights against the damage you do to it. And up to a certain period of life, you don't notice these things. You think the body is taking the beating uh, rather well. And if it doesn't do so well, you can always have a bypass or something and get away with it. Why have a bypass when we would not have it nearly have as much chance of it if you constantly guard your conduct? Now, there's no question in the world that for many people it's too late to prevent some of the damage. In fact, they don't even know that they've done anything wrong. And there's no use bothering them or trying to hurt them or make life more difficult for them. The main thing is to realize that somewhere in the pattern of things, there is a rule that when we learn it, 
can do a great deal to lengthen life. In alchemy, we have the same thinking, the mysterious elixir of life. It's symbolized in the ancient alchemical writings, or at least in some of them, um, very dramatically, by the fact of resurrection. The philosopher's stone is represented by Christ raising himself from the dead. Wisdom, beauty, love, and truth are instruments of resurrection. Evils are transmuted by virtues. All hatreds and all discords are transmuted by simple, honest love. And in all of our problems as we advance in years, the love we have given will be found in the health and happiness of retirement. The loves we have denied will be denied to us. The kindnesses we have done will return to us. The self-centeredness and selfishness will return in the form of loneliness and more or less self-pity. So it's perfectly possible to make a good retirement, but you should really start it to be really optimistic the day you're born. Now, you'll probably be a little young to understand the point at that time, but then Comenius, the great educator, pointed it out. And that is, he says that the essential education of the human being is found in the mother school. The child's future, including his life and for practical purposes, his retirement, it will be taught to him at his mother's knee. It will be taught before he ever goes to school. The school may show him how to die with courage, but the mother school, what he learns in his infancy by example and by instruction, will later shine out through his retirement years and bestow the blessing of a larger life. So we will gain most by the simple learning of the values of the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. And if we live these in gentle sincerity through the years of life, we will have very few people who will not have a pleasant retirement, a useful one, in which a growth, service to others, improvement of self, constant dedication to the final achievement of the divine purpose, will not only help us, but as it gets more general, will probably bring the peace to the world that we're all so hopeful for. So if you want that good retirement, start now. Thank you very much.